And to talk about this potpourri of political action, I'm joined here at the big table tonight by Tyson Barker. He is with the Aspen Institute here in Berlin. He also once worked for the U.S. State Department. Tyson, it's good to have you on the show. I want us to just stop for a moment and consider the events that are playing out right now at the same time. We've got the race for the White House that is about to get very serious. Right. And at the same time, we've got an impeachment trial, which could end the Trump presidency. It begins next week. Um, these are, as I said, like a split screen reality that we have ra we rarely, if ever, have experienced in the, the history of the U.S. Right, and then we also have, you know, the uh, trade detente between the U.S. and China. That's, of course, the narrative that the White House is putting out there. But let's be honest, then we have action uh, taking place in Russia. And, you know, everything that happened with Iraq and Iran now seems like ancient history. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything keeps getting crowded out. We're in such a saturated environment. And honestly, that's kind of what the Trump White House wants is everything to continue to get layered over so that we forget about things like impeachment. But, you know, one thing that has changed since the original vote in the House and today when the articles were sent over is, first of all, we have the willingness of John Bolton to testify. Mm -hmm. And second of all, we have new information from Lev Parnas, who will be giving an interview in the United States, I think today or tomorrow, uh, linking um, Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani, to actual perhaps uh, spying espionage on the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. So a lot of developments are still happening in this case. And with all of, considering all of that, do you think then when the trial starts next week that we're going to have a screeching halt to all of these things happening and the world will then be able to focus on this impeachment trial? Well, the one thing we know for certain is that we have three acting senators, uh, mm -hmm. sitting senators who are taking place in the Democratic primary, and they all take their jobs quite seriously. Mm -hmm. we, and they've all indicated that they will be there for the trial. They will be there to submit questions and, and render a judgment. So they will not be on the campaign trail mm -hmm. in, in Iowa. Um, and we'll see how much that draws attention back to Washington, but mm -hmm. the campaign continues to go forward. And, and we, we've never seen um, a, a constellation like that either, have we, where we've got actually more than three senators, several senators, when you consider the ones who have right. dropped out of the race, um, who will be acting as jurors and who also would like to win in November and replace this president. Right. I mean, let's be honest, that gets back to the fact that this is, in essence, and not a strictly criminal uh, trial. It is a political exercise. It's written into the United States Constitution. And people could say, well, that does present some sort of conflict of interest. But on the other side of the aisle, we have mm -hmm. uh, Mitch McConnell and, and members of the Republican Party who have said that they've already come to a conclusion of what the verdict will be. Yeah, and, and Schiff, today, you know, he would, he would say to you, no, that's not true. Um, this is a trial. The forefathers wanted it to be a trial the way we expect a trial to be. Evidence, witnesses, documents. Do you think all those, all those things will be allowed next week? Uh, well, it's it's trending in that direction. Um, there are several Republican senators who are kind of seen as the, the make or break for whether or not witnesses and, and evidence will be able to be presented. And we've already had, for example, Mitt Romney come out and say, if John Bolton wants to testify, I'm going to be on the side that has John Bolton testify. Mm -hmm. So we're already seeing movement towards a majority to have witnesses. The Republicans themselves are looking at constellations that would kind of, in their opinion, level the field on that, mm -hmm. saying if we allow John Bolton, for example, to testify, we need to allow Hunter Biden or have Hunter Biden testify mm -hmm. as well. But uh, we're just at the beginning of that negotiation. Who benefits from all of this in, in the presidential race? I'm thinking of Mayor Pete Buttigieg, for example. He doesn't have to go to Washington next week. Uh, he can keep campaigning in Iowa. Right. And and theoretically, mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Biden, Biden as, well. as well. He will be able, and Tom Steyer, they'll all be able to be present in Iowa and New Hampshire. Of course, the trial is focused on, at least as a side matter, on, on Hunter Biden's uh, seat on the board of Burisma. Mm -hmm. um, and just one more developing story yeah. that we should note, uh, the servers of Burisma were hacked this by week. By the Russians, By the right? Russians. So this is another developing, uh, I mean, there's just so much news in this very live investigation still taking place. Um, the debate last night, who came out, what would you say, on top? 
I think it was a draw. I mean, really, there was nobody who landed a, a, a super meaningful punch. The, the main kind of optical takeaway was Elizabeth Warren zinger about, you know, every woman on the stage, her and Amy Klobuchar, having won all of their elections right. and the men collectively having <clears throat> lost 10. Yeah. Um, but generally, I don't think that there were any real knockouts. What was interesting is the emphasis on foreign policy that yeah. took place at the start. And what the candidates all tried to do was say, you know, who has the judgment for this? role. There's a lot of um, engagement fatigue abroad, mm. you know, a lot of desire to bring troops home. There was a lot of attacking on uh, Trump for the incident in Iraq and the, uh, the tension with Iran, and a lot of, uh, you know, noting, noting that he ran to end these endless wars, President Trump, and that he has actually deployed more troops in the region rather than withdraw them. So a lot of uh, a critique on Trump for his, his position in the Middle East. Will Iowa be as important as Iowa would like to see itself? I mean, what about if Mayor Pete Buttigieg, some say people say he will pull off a surprise win in Iowa. Will that help him or make a difference? Well, Iowa is not a microcosm of the United States. Right. It's quite rural, it's quite white. Um, uh, Iowa and New Hampshire both have demographics that are not reflective of the Democratic Party more broadly. Mm. Uh, both states could render a victory for somebody like Pete uh, or Elizabeth Warren. And, and to be honest, it's still very fluid, and there's kind of a four-way tie between the four-way frontrunners in both states. But it's Super Tuesday that really matters, it's, right? Right, exactly. So then after the first two uh, caucus and the first primary, you do a sweep of the South where a, a preponderant uh, po portion of the population is African-American in the Democratic primary. And what the polls are currently showing, particularly among older African-Americans, is they're solidly behind Biden. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see if that can keep him through because a lot of commentators were not impressed by his performance last night. Tyson Barker, as always, Tyson, we appreciate your analysis. Thank you. Thank you.